Thessalonian you're fighting. He's the biggest man I've ever seen. I wouldn't want to fight him. That's why no one will remember your name. Glory? Have you gone mad? There is no glory to be had now. Only retreat or surrender or death. An age of freedom. And all will know that 300 Spartans gave their last breath to defend it. It's an amazing thing about war that an act of symbolism can be almost as important as the guns or the bombs themselves. This is a story how merely 16 tons of bombs changed the entire course of a world war. And what's even more remarkable is that every single bomber that took part in this raid was lost. A 100% loss rate. There are few events in history where an attack loses 100% of its planes and still could be called a success. For the European theatre, it was reckoned that a loss rate of merely 5% per mission was unsustainable for a bomber force. I mean, let me just give you this as a ballpark number. For the World War II as a whole, there were about 50 million dead and 50 million tons of munitions used. Meaning that for the whole of World War II, for every dead person, which will say weighs about 100 kilos, it took about 10 times their body weight of explosives, of, of munitions, to kill them. So in these ballpark figures, what can you expect from 16 tons of explosives to kill maybe 16 people? How could that ever be significant? Especially when looked in the numbers towards the end of the war, where the Allies were laying waste to Axis cities, typically dropping 3,000 tons of bombs at a time. Yet without question, more was achieved by these mere 16 tons of bombs. And even stranger, at the time, these mere 16 tons of bombs was right on the limit of what the US military could do. I am, of course, referring to the Doolittle raid. Now, Doolittle himself was a remarkable guy in his own right. He was a test pilot with an impressive string of achievements to his name. Now, after Pearl Harbor, America really was on the back foot in the Pacific theater. Virtually every battleship of the Pacific Fleet was out of action, leaving merely three Virgin carriers to counter the six Japanese veteran carriers. Pearl Harbor was a devastating blow, both militarily and psychologically. The sentiment was pretty well summed up by Churchill. In all the war, I have never received a more direct shock. As I turned and twisted in bed, the full horror of the news sank into me. There were no British or American capital ships in the Indian Ocean or the Pacific, except the American survivors of Pearl Harbor, who were hastening back to California. Over the vast expanse of the waters, Japan was supreme, and we everywhere were weak and naked. Now, it should be said that the guy who organized the Pearl Harbor raid, Yamamoto, was also a clever guy. And from the other side, he had had grave misgivings about the blow against Pearl Harbor and had predicted that he would be able to run amok for six months to a year, after which he had no long-term hopes of victory because he had seen the industrial might of America. And this prediction, you will see, is stunningly prophetic. Now, America had a problem. They wanted to strike back against Japan, but with what? And what they came up with was remarkable. They were going to take two of their surviving aircraft carriers and load one of them up with medium bombers. And they were going to take it halfway around the world and bomb Japan with it. And then they were going to fly the bombers onto China while the carriers hightailed it back to safety. Now, there were many practical elements to this. The Americans had worked out that they could take these medium bombers off from a carrier. A marker was set up on Eglin's airstrip to simulate the takeoff deck of a carrier. The crews had to get their B-25s airborne in 450 feet or less. But the landing on a carrier was simply out of the question. At this time in the war, America was actually fairly advanced in carrier operations and typically had custom-made planes for their carriers. But these were land-based bombers, not designed to be used on a carrier. The whole thing was done in an amazingly short period of time, merely four months from the conception of the idea to the planes actually launching. 
Now, Doolittle had gone through the specs of the planes and had worked out the best plane for the job, the B-25 Mitchell. No one had ever taken off a fully loaded B-25 in less than 500 feet. He'd also chosen the most experienced squadron he could that flew those planes, and they'd given them lots of practice at short takeoffs. Nonetheless, the very first time an American bomber took off from an American aircraft carrier was when Doolittle himself, in the deep Pacific, floored it and headed for Japan. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. The downside, of course, of medium bombers is they couldn't be put beneath deck, meaning that the Hornet, loaded with B-25s, sail out under the Golden Gate Bridge in plain sight. It also meant that the Hornet couldn't be used for regular carrier operations, so that in the mid-Pacific, the Hornet hooked up with the Enterprise, which was going to provide air cover for the entire task force. But the most obvious downside of medium bombers is they couldn't carry many bombs. Indeed, they only carried about one ton of bombs each. And further, in order to get the necessary fuel on the planes and give them the most range possible, they had to strip almost everything out of the bombers, including the tail gun, and to replace it with, I kid you not, a couple of broom handles painted black, which, from a distance, credibly looked like machine guns. 16 tons of bombs against an entire nation. It was purely symbolic. Operationally insignificant, but this strike led to a sequence of actions that was the very turning point of the Pacific theater. Now, the Americans had every intention of not losing these bombers and landing them in China where they could be further used. However, things didn't quite go as planned and the task force was detected about 10 hours before they were planning to launch. On the morning of April 18, 1942, the task force was sighted by Japanese patrol boats. The boats were quickly destroyed, but they could have transmitted a position report. Nonetheless, the Americans decided to launch a couple of hundred miles short of their planned takeoff point. Now, they knew that would make getting to China tough. Nonetheless, they flew in low and then climbed only to drop their bombs. We came in on the deck. We pulled up to about 1,500 feet to bomb in order to make sure that we weren't hit by the fragments of our own bomb. They encountered almost no resistance, which is hardly surprising. As far as the Japanese were concerned, America was 5,000 miles to the east. The last thing they expected was relatively short-range medium bombers flying in from the east. But resistance or not, the real problem for the flyers is that they had launched early and there wasn't enough fuel to get them to China. However, fortune smiled on the Raiders and they had a 20 mile tailwind for almost the entire trip, which just about made up for their lack of fuel. When they arrived at China, it was getting dark and the majority of them had to simply parachute out, abandoning their aircraft. Only one aircraft actually landed, which was in Russia, where it was interned. Every single aircraft that took part in the raid was lost. You see, the Japanese had long claimed that the home islands would never be bombed, that their military was going to provide an impenetrable wall of defense. Nonetheless, they had also kept up with regular air raid drills to keep a positive military sentiment at a high fever pitch among an already highly martialized population. The raids, however, couldn't be hushed up, so they were portrayed as an act of indiscriminate barbarism, bombing innocent civilians, even though, as with Pearl Harbor, the targets had been overwhelmingly military or industrial in nature. The raid was almost as flawless as you can expect from dropping a mere 16 or so tons of bombs on a nation the size of Japan. What do you expect from 16 tons of bombs? Now, Doolittle, the leader of the raid, had expected to be court-martialed because the mission had been a dismal failure with catastrophic losses, which on paper, militarily, it was. America had sailed a task force consisting of almost the entire Pacific Fleet's useful capital ships all the way across the Pacific, some 10,000 men, 6,000 on the two carriers, and about 4,000 on the cruisers and destroyers. Preparing meals for 3,000 men was a project on a truly grand scale. 
sailing for over two weeks, some 5,000 miles to take 16 medium bombers, each one of which was lost in the raid, 100% loss rate to drop merely 16 tons of bombs on Japan, which at the time was thought to have killed about 10 people. 16 planes made in America and transported halfway around the world to kill merely 10 Japanese. Yeah, you can see how at the time, Doolittle might have been disappointed by this. However, that's not how it worked out. The psychological impact was huge. It was a PR coup for America. It was a huge morale boost. And rather than getting court-martialed, Doolittle was given the Congressional Medal of Honor and promoted. Who cared about the cost? Across America, this was seen as payback for Pearl Harbor. Now, in military terms and on paper, there was simply no comparison. The Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor with some six aircraft carriers, sporting some 360 aircraft, each one of which carrying about half a ton of bombs, so 200-odd tons, killing about 2,500 people, although about half of those were due to when the battleship Arizona blew up. The Doolittle raid was one aircraft carrier, launching 16 planes with 16 tons of bombs, killing some 10 people, although after the war, that number went up to about 100. But it really didn't make any difference in the impact that it had. The home islands had been shown to be vulnerable to the whole world. They had shown that American bombers could fly over the Emperor's palace. Incidentally, they were given strict instructions not to bomb or shoot at the Emperor's palace, as such actions would have incensed the Japanese and prolonged the war. It's just an interesting thing of how symbolism worked. They tied the friendship medals that they'd given to the Japanese to the bombs. Japanese medals awarded United States officers for humanitarian aid to the Japanese people are returned attached to 500 pound bombs. Medals given to some ex-Navy enlisted men by the Japanese in 1908 were affixed to bombs by Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle. They were to be returned by his raiders to Japan with a loud bang but weren't so crazy about the symbolism to actually try and bomb the emperor or his palace. I, I made the order that no one will bomb the imperial palace because I felt it would do little damage and it would uh, sew the Japanese nation together better than any other thing that could happen. Now, the Japanese mounted a huge attempt to capture the flyers and were brutal to the Chinese in the process, killing tens of thousands of them. And for all of that, in the end, they only managed to capture about 10% of the air crew, with the remaining 90% eventually making it back to America. It also rattled the Japanese that the Chinese air bases might be used to mount attacks on Japan, causing them to divert huge resources to countering this threat. It also caused the Japanese to keep substantial numbers of their aircraft for the defense of the homeland, weakening their strike forces elsewhere. All of that despite the fact that the Americans had no intention of repeating this symbolic act. It caused the retention of aircraft in Japan for the defense of the home islands when we had no intentions of hitting them again seriously in the near future. But most importantly, the shame it had put on the Japanese Navy, who had not only failed to prevent the raid, failed to protect the emperor, but had failed to intercept the retreating warships. And although every single plane on the raid was lost, not one of them was due to the actions of the Japanese military. That convinced Yamamoto to try and push his area of influence further into the Pacific, to the Aleutian Islands, and to a tiny, almost unknown atoll of Midway Island, where almost six months to the day after Pearl Harbor, Three American carriers served by good intelligence, the element of surprise, and an outrageous slice of luck sent the cream of the Japanese fleet to the bottom. But how one of the most decisive naval battles in history went from the Japanese robustly shooting down wave after wave of American planes out of the sky with no damage to the Japanese fleet to within five minutes the core of the Japanese fleet, the cream, the pride of their mobile attack force, burning in ruins. 
is a story for another day. And that is the story of the Doolittle Raid. Now, if you enjoyed that, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and say what you thought about it. And if you really like this video and want to see more like it, you can consider supporting this channel through Patreon. And I'll leave the links for that below.